everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Sarlacc Digest, a special edition. And no, it's not a hot topic because I'm hosting it and Scott's with me. It's actually a Sarlacc Digest special edition interview. And look who we have with us, Mr. Kevin Scott, straight from over the Atlantic. Hello, Mr. Kevin Scott. How are you? Hello there. I'm fine. Thank you very much. What about you? I'm fantastic because you're with us good, talking good. Star Wars. Oh, That's you say the nicest about. things. I do. And I do that yeah. for all our guests. Oh, I thought I was special. No, not at all, Kevin. No, I'm just... Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Good deal. But, no, I'll tell you what. You are special because uh, you put together a lot. You are involved in a lot of Star Wars content, right? I was uh, yeah. showing Scott before. I'm on. There's a reason you're on. You know, we have tons <laughs> of things to talk about that we're going to go through. And I'm even going to talk okay. about these a minute, even though this is, I'm Excellent. really not the demographic for this, right? At all. <laughs> the <laughs> so choose I your own adventure. So I thought, Kevin, I didn't think I was that, but I, I think I am. All right. Well, I'll say, I, my, my view of all these things is if you like Star Wars, you're the demographic for any Star Wars, you know, you, you, whether you're young, old, young at heart, whatever. Um, I mean, I'm still, you know, so I'm, I'm late forties. I still read stuff that is allegedly for children. And, you know, I think as long as it's got a good story and it's told well, I think you can get something out of it. I love it. And, and we're pretty much the same way. Like, I don't sit there and do book reviews usually on like a, a choose your own destiny. But no. sure as heck, I might. Because you, 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 <laughs> you, got me, you got me a couple times. So let's, let's start out here. You're obviously busy with Star Wars and stuff. And we're going to get into that. But you do a lot of, a lot of nerd stuff when you, when you look into it. And mm -hmm. um, you're a horror fan. All these things. So it really fits well with our demographic. Because Marco, who's usually the other host. Um, right huge horror fan like he has the, the universal monsters tattooed on his leg type of thing so nice. when you did that the other day he was so bummed he wouldn't be here but just tell us a little bit about your history what 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 are you what have you worked on what have you done um so other than star wars before that i was mainly known for doctor who so i've been working on doctor who over here in the uk for about 20 years so before it came oh, back wow. um on tv um when it was the books the audios the comics uh, and that kind of thing um i'm a i'm a massive as you say a, ma a massive nerd my to-do list is the same now as it was when i was 10 which is the way i always want to keep it um <laughs> so yeah horror has been a massive part of my sort of fandoms um and, and growing up when i was a kid I was a huge Doctor Who fan in the time sort of the mid 70s when, you know, it was basically doing its best to rip off Hammer Horror every five minutes. Um, and that led me to Hammer Horror and that led me to Universal and that led me to Stephen King. And um, I was doomed from that point on, really. Um, so, yeah, I've worked on everything from Vikings to Pacific Rim to Transformers. Um, but, yeah, the two main ones probably um, are Doctor Who and more recently in really taking over everything is Star Wars. Right on. As it should be, Kevin. As it yeah, should. exactly. exactly. <laughs> right. There, there's nothing else. We're kind of like that. It's like there's Star Wars, and then there's everything else. Is like there. <laughs> and then there's that over there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what's your favorite movie? Star Wars. Yeah. All of it. <laughs> you all right. Can't really um, break it up. So, how how did you get with doing all that stuff? Did you make a call to somebody? I always ask this, right? Did Did you make a call mm. to somebody and say, "Hey, I want to do some Star Wars stuff"? Can somebody get me involved in Star Wars? Did they come after you and be like, "You know what? You would fit." right into our, our style. Well, I think what had, hap what had happened, so over here in the UK, there was an opportunity to do a book series for kids, a middle grade book series. Um, it was going to be called Adventures in Wild Space. And it, it was coming out around the time of The Force Awakens. And Egmont Books over here had the license. They had the license to original fiction, which was a big thing because there hadn't been any original fiction in the UK for a while. Um, but it couldn't be based on any of the original uh, original trilogy characters it couldn't be based on any of the new sequel trilogy um because it wasn't a trilogy then there wasn't even a first movie yet then um so they came up with this idea of doing it as something set between the prequels and the original trilogy with a bunch of kids so it's a it literally kids in space and in star wars um which hadn't been done for a while i mean it has been done but not you know hadn't been done for a while um i had written for other properties books in that area so around the same kind of like length of books aimed at the same age group i would written loads of books um do you remember the skylanders game that came out a few years ago when you got oh, the little figures yes so, i had to hunt uh, for every damn figure all over I know, yes i know <laughs> I, I wrote the majority of the books for that um under the pen name of onk beekman who was a character in skylanders um and so i'd written those i took 20 30 books i think in total um and i, I was doing things sort of around that age group um, and was working with Egmont, I think on Ben 10 at the time. Um, and they knew that I was a big Star Wars fan um, and they knew I had written a lot in this area. 
Um, and so they put a call through to my agency and if I would like to do an audition piece for it, they had a, a scene they wanted to write. And I know a few people wrote that scene um, and they came back and, and liked my version of it. So that was the start of it. So um, it was between me, another guy called Tom Huddleston and we sort of did alternates in the series. So we, we did a little sort of, um, sort of taster book, a sampler book, which I wrote. Um, and then we did six of those novels alternatively which ran for about a year or so um and that was my yeah that was my sort of in with writing star wars and it it went from there really yeah well and what's neat is too you you write not just like when i watch somebody like um like author like zahn or gray or so they just do the novels mm. right mm. you're hitting it on all different levels kevin because you even you even work on the the game show right on the uh yeah <laughs> yeah mean, so you're, i i, you're I write everywhere. the everywhere I wrote the stories. Well, this is this. I'm, I'm a freelancer who basically is terrified of not having work, as all good freelancers are. And yeah. so, from the off, I've, I've tried to write in as many different media as I can because obviously you're spreading the risk. Um, but I didn't come from write from writing prose. I came from writing audio. So originally, go right back. I was a magazine journalist. I worked on things like SFX magazine and over here T3 magazine, which is technology mag, computer mag, things like that. Um, and around that time was when I pitched with a friend of mine a Doctor Who audio play um, for a company that was just starting out called Big Finish, who were producing these official Doctor Who radio plays. And we got one of the, the early ones of those. And so I started by writing audio and writing ra radio um, and wrote that for years without writing anything else, really, and then got a, got a gig on a comic and then got a gig on prose. So I sort of went the I'm probably now know within Star Wars first sort of comics and, and novels, first and foremost. But originally it was audio um, in my career, um, which is why I was really happy when Dooku came around and, and I got a chance to sort of spread into that area in Star Wars as well. But there's also a benefit of you know, this is my job. This is what I do day in, day out. And it's the best job in the world. And I would never complain. I mean, I do complain every now and then because everyone complains about their job, don't right. they? But, you know, when you're writing a novel and, you know, I've just written um, The Rising Storm for the High Republic series. You know, that's a big old book. Um, and it takes a long time to write a novel. It's very nice then to be able to go, I tell you what, I'm going to take a few days off of that and write a comic because it's a completely different part of your brain you're using. It's a different, um, completely different technique. Um, same so storytelling, same, literally same universe in this case, with what I've been doing recently. Um, but yeah, it just means you can take a break from that one, you know, that one part of your job and do and, and be creative in another way. And that's how I like to work. I like to be able to, it keeps what keeps me fresh. What It's how I keep working and how I keep, producing and as much as I've been producing over the last couple of years because if I was just writing novels I would get bogged down very very quickly um, mm -hmm. so I, I like jumping around and and hopefully doing enough good enough job on all of them but um, I like changing shifting up on the medium and I think you learn things different things so you know I, I've learned things writing comics and audio that I can then use in books um, and, and vice versa that's awesome. Like, you know, when it comes to cool. when it comes to writing your comics, how do you approach the scripts for the comics? Do you uh, do you ask the the artist to actually do the specific frames, or do you let the artist take kind of the reins on the art style, or not it's the a art bit style? Of both. Okay, it's a bit of both. So, I mean, um, so when you're writing comics, there's two main methods. There's the mm -hmm. full script, and then there's what's called the Marvel method. Um, and the Marvel method is for those who don't know. It's basically when Stan Lee was writing 78 comics a month or whatever it seemed he was writing in the 60s, he didn't have time to script anything. So he used to talk to Steve Ditko and whatever and say, right, so you have a couple of pages of Peter having an argument with, with MJ and then he has a little scene with um, Aunt May and then he fights, the, fights Doc Ock for 10 pages and you know they would go away and they would draw these main things and then stan would go back and write the dialogue to fit now modern marvel is a bit half and half you, you basically write it as a synopsis and then the artist breaks it down what we do on the marvel uh, i'm sorry what we do on star wars um is that we have to be a bit more descriptive so we we when we write our scripts we do write panel suggestions so you know you write okay. you know page one panel one two three four five the description of what goes in there and the dialogue only because it has to get approved by Lucasfilm before the artist starts. And Makes so sense. if I'm saying, oh, and then the artist might do this or might do that, it will just go round and round and round in circles. So yeah, we script stuff in full script, but I always say in my scripts, look, this is what I'm suggesting. And if they're really unlucky, I draw, a, <laughs> draw one. <laughs> um, but they, they should never look at those. Um, 
but if they come back to me and go actually that's you know it should be three panels and you've put it in under five or you know or actually i think you need a couple more panels in this or why don't we make that a splash and push that you know then obviously we change we change it and we we adapt it because especially when you're writing comics and that's why i love writing comics like audio it's not just you telling a story on your own when you're writing a novel obviously it's you and yeah your editor story group if it's star wars you know mike siglay and all the people that have their say in it but it's largely you and a keyboard um when you're doing a comic it's you and the artist and the inker and the colorist and the uh, editor and that's what i love about it because for example um i can't go into too much detail about it but the, the high republic marvel series we've got coming um i started to write it before ario joined and then as soon as Ario started putting pages in, the story changed slightly because I suddenly knew what Ario could do. And I suddenly I had a big two hour chat with him on the phone about what he likes in Star Wars, what he likes in comics, what he's also a big horror fan as well. So that definitely influenced things. Um, and so it, it, that's why I love comics, because it's not just one voice. It's a, a few voices working together. And it's so a collaborative. collaboration. Yeah, 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 exactly. Same with audio drama and drama for TV or, or whatever. You're writing a script, not so much for the end, the viewer or the listener. You're writing a script for the director, for the producer and for the, for the actors. They then interpret it um, and add their own mix, in, uh, to add their own twist into the mix. And so what you get is greater than, than just one person's view. So it's why I find comics so exciting. Um, and it's why I, find, I love audio as well, because writing can be quite solitary, but it, it, actually when, you, when you've got a good comic team, it isn't, it is a team. Um, and it's the most exciting way to, to work if you, in my opinion. Awesome. You know, we were talking, before you came on, we were talking about the, the process and the team, the teamwork it would take to do a project like High Republic, right? And obviously mm. not getting into anything specific. We have it like, we imagine it, Okay, our, us regular people, us fuggles, you know, non-force folks. So we, we assume <laughs> you're, uh, you're in there and somebody says, okay, I have this idea. And then you go round table and it's like, this won't work because of this, this, this. And I see how you work with your encyclopedias and you go through and check things and yeah. canonize and what can work and what cannot. Is that kind of how it works or am, am I way overthinking that you guys are all like, no, no, I mean, this out? it has been a joint project between the five of us. So, um, we all had the initial idea. We, we, one of us put the initial idea through, then all of us sat down and pulled it apart and put it back together again. Um, and we obviously did that with Story and we did that with, with the editorial teams as well. Um, and yeah, we rec we're in touch every day um, in one way or another. And yes, we have conversations, sometimes they get heated, you know, as all creative things can get, you know, we have opposing ideas of how uh, a character should work, a plot point point should work but you know what they those are always the best moments because actually you get something better out of it um and we have got it's not a cast of thousands in the high republic but there's a hell of a lot of characters and so that it has been a case of at the moment when in, as we've been working on these these first projects you know a few of us have been dealing with those characters a few that do with these characters and then just like in the real world, where we all sort of like, oh, this is what I'm doing in the comic, or this is what I'm doing in the IDW, or this is what I'm doing in the, in the middle grade. When you start doing that, having that conversation, you have those moments go, oh, but that doesn't quite work with what I've just written, or what I'm planning to write. So you either have to, then you have to do a negotiation, then you have to, you know, try and find a way to make it all tie up. And most of the time, you actually get something that's far stronger, because, you know, you're forced to problem solve together um and and yeah so it, it's again it's a very different thing to write in a star wars novel on your own it's you know it's you're writing a star wars novel or you're writing a comic but you're also aware there's four other people writing in that particular part of the of, yeah, of the galaxy no, it, as well it seems wild and with the group group of people you have i i, mm. I can't imagine anything yeah. less than us being super excited come january 5th when it launches right is that the, yeah. that's the launch day and you guys do a, a, yeah. a launch day on the fourth right we do, yeah. Special. Sure. Yeah. Um, I we can't imagine. I mean, it could be, and we could all be sad doing a podcast about it after. But I really don't <laughs> no, think. No, you won't be. No, no that's that's be. not our plan. We're we've been pushing this pretty not maybe not as hard as you, Gavin. I, I watch you on Twitter, but we we push it fairly hard, and we're talking. We're all into the book, so we really yeah. hope all of our listeners and everybody else that we can possibly touch grab all of these pieces. 
Um, but let's talk a little bit for a second about your other stuff, about, about the stuff that's already out and the things that I've, I've been into. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit real fast these choose your own destinies because I have a bone to pick. Yeah. I have, a, <laughs> I, I have a problem that when the choice is and there's a dark hole, should Anakin go down this hole or use the ladder? And I use the ladder and it ends the story. I'm pretty upset because, damn it, the ladder is the safe choice, Kevin. What am I supposed to do? When I did that like Anakin four times ever, through these books. I'm like, I keep dying. <laughs> when would Anakin ever take the safe choice? That's See, a great. That's what's fun. I that's know. And that's what's answer. fun. That's what's fun about the books. And that's all I wanted to say was like, I'm trying to like, when I'm doing them, I'm like, okay, should I do what Anakin would do? Or should I do this? Like, for example, when it <laughs> says, don't use your lightsaber, Anakin, don't do it. What should you do? Either steal the lightsaber or use the force to destroy the remotes. Damn it. I use the force to destroy the remotes. I thought using the saber would be mean or rude. But damn it, Kevin, you took me down the wrong way and I did the wrong thing again. <laughs> so I just want to say that- It's so, so fun. It makes it so much fun. A, also because I get to blow up the Millennium Falcon and kill R2-D2 um, and then go, it's all all right, it didn't happen. It didn't, um, that has been our interview with Kevin Scott. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get the fun thing was actually they weren't supposed to be choose your own adventure books. They were plain norm, ordinary books when they were commissioned. And the Han and Chewie one, which was to time with Solo. Yeah. Um, it'd been a long time coming and they, after I finished Adventures in Wild Time, they said, would you be interested in writing a middle grade novel for Han and Chewie? I was like, yeah, of course I will. <laughs> no, no, I don't <laughs> oh, want to right. do that. No, don't be stupid. <laughs> um, my agent was shaking their fist at me going, just appear to be a little bit aloof in this. You know, it's like, <laughs> would you like to write Han and Chewie? Yes, I would. For free. How much? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Did you ever, did you actually mention any money with them? No, of course not, it's Han and Chewie. All right, brilliant. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I signed, I signed up to do it and we had a, a general idea. We had to change the general idea because I basically guessed a part of Solo. So I had to really go, just change that completely and come up with a different plot. And then right at the last minute, they said, oh, and by the way, how do you find, feel about making these choose your own adventure? And again, being a freelancer, I went, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Put the phone down and went, how the hell do I do that? <laughs> um, having never written, I tried to, I tried to write, one, write one years ago for a Pirates of the Caribbean project I was on and realized it was far too difficult and would never do it. Um, but I, they got me now. I was suckered. I'd signed. And then they decided this is the way they wanted to go. So I literally had to go and get one of the, uh, my old fighting fantasy books, which was a series we had over here of horror, fantasy, children adventure books. Um, and literally had to rip it to pieces and stick it on a wall to work out how you map a story like that. Um, so for a couple of days, I looked like I was either trying to catch a serial killer or become a serial killer. Uh, <laughs> and so worked out, sort of reverse engineered how to write one of these books. And I think by the time I'd written the fourth one, of that series. I think I just about worked it out, but it was the first one was a bit like, really? Okay, this is, I think this is how it works. Um, they are a nightmare to write. I mean, they're fun, but they are a nightmare. Um, I, I imagine. Yeah, a lot of fun. yeah it, you know, it's a lot of fun. And I, I was really pleased that, you know, yeah, people were picking up, it, they're, made, they're made for kids, but I tried to make them as fun as possible because I knew that it's Star Wars, so not just kids would be reading it. Yeah, well, um, success because you got you caught me, and then even yeah, even yeah. that Han and Chewie one, I was mad because I went and took Han to the cannons, and oops, yeah. I should have let Chewie yeah. take the cannons. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah, Always. I, I I haven't read a uh, India. I haven't read a choose your own adventure novel since I was a kid, and I kept killing Indiana Jones, and I was just yeah. like this this I can't I can't handle this pressure, so I, I can't imagine what it's like to write something like that. I know. There was one point in the Luke and Leia one when the editor, Kate, wrote back to him and went, have you just killed Luke Skywalker? <laughs> I went, well, you don't actually see him die, but he is falling into a big pit of giant crabs. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> said, Can we do this? Can we do this in a kid's book? And then I sent her the pages of these old books I used to read, the Fancy Pantsy ones, and it horrified her <laughs> what, <laughs> what it was like in the late 70s and early 80s for kids to read books in the UK, which seem to be much darker than what's com what comes out in the States sometimes. Um, I don't know if it's any, uh, part of our psyche. Um, 70s and 80s for any kind of entertainment for oh, kids was a little bit dark. Terrifying. Yeah, terrifying. Really Even here in I the mean, US. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad it's not yeah. just us. I mean, we were... We had stuff over, we had basically, you know, Wicker Man for kids over here. You know, there was something called Children of the Stones, which was basically human sacrifice. Um, 
and actually black magic and sacrifice appeared a lot in kids um, tv shows i was wow. really worried that was going to be my life you know i would i would end up in quicksand in or <laughs> or being sacrificed in a black mass on christmas eve because that seemed to happen to everyone uh, all the way through british tv yeah we, so, we, were, um, we grew up fearing quicksand out here yeah. too yeah i know it it's horrifying. not been the problem i thought it it was going to be yeah, in life. Not at Hadn't all. Hadn't seen it again until Force Awakens, really. I mean, it yeah, been yeah, gone. I mean, yeah. I quite like the fact they brought it back, you know, yeah. because yeah. it is that old sort of, you know, Flash Gordon-esque thing. That, it sure was. Yeah. If you don't mind me asking, uh, if you can say, what portion of Solo did you guess? Um, oh, it was basically the um, freeing the slaves and they're going down in the mine and the castle right well, i saw it wasn't a certain castle but it was the, basically the same thing and it was wookies being down the mine as well and i mean this happened so one of the events in wild space i opened the, the first one i opened with the opening of rogue one not knowing what was at the beginning of rogue one. Oh man so um <laughs> it, does, it happens more often than you think because really? you've got no idea what's going on in star wars um right. behind the scenes and so yeah so the original opener i had was um a kid being whose parents put her in in a rock <laughs> because the um, stormtroopers are coming and they're still, and they don't want the, they don't let the stormtrooper know there's a kid on the planet and so they came down very quickly and they went you can't do that why just because you can't do that and then I watched Rogue One <laughs> and I came out of the cinema and I phoned Mike Sklain and went that's why wasn't it he went yes it was yes. <laughs> but, because at that point I wasn't I wasn't as NDA'd as I am now so I you know I right. couldn't they, they couldn't tell me stuff so um yeah back in the beginning it was quite it's quite a nice feeling though when you, when you guess something because yeah. it means that you're on the right tracks you know right so you should well, that's how we sense. feel if we ever get anything right that we because we try to theory craft the hell out of everything if you oh, write yeah. if you yeah. write a sentence we're going to take it out for two hours and discuss it on the show that's, that's what we do yeah. so it's neat to see that you guys end up guessing things like that way you yeah. guys are obviously I mean, uh, uh, professionals. we do get there's still a lot that isn't you know that is is secret to us you know we, we don't know you see code names on documents but not knowing what the code name is you know so for, for solo it was red cup and i didn't even know uh, and also as a brit i didn't know what a red cup solo cup thing was that made of no course. sense to me yeah so um so things that you know you'd see notes saying this relates to something in red cup and you go that's nice what's red cup <laughs> um and it so because obviously you know they have to make sure there's no they, they as many thing you know they've they've put as many fingers in the dam as possible as to keep things secretly you know secret secret so we knew we know a bit more now from doing the high republic but um but yeah it's there's still loads of stuff i, I was watching that call last week you know the investor and there was still mm -hmm. stuff i was like oh really oh right okay um you know so it's yeah the, the, it's great but it's um i i prefer it when i don't know stuff unless yeah. i have to because at the end of the day i'm still a fan so right. It's been the nice thing of not working on Doctor Who for a few years that I can just watch Doctor Who again, you know, because I was really involved in that. And so I knew what the season was and I was watching wow. with my kids. And they were loving it. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Masters at the end. Um, you know, <laughs> and it was just obviously I didn't say that to them, but that's what was going through my head. And then the Daleks were coming. Um, and so I felt that a bit that when Mandalorian season one, because I knew what was going to what was happening. But Mandalorian season two, I have no idea, which is brilliant. So it's like going back to being just someone watching star wars again that's awesome if you can say why did you know about mando one because they told us when we were planning um high republic so we didn't Step we basically were told what we could do and what we couldn't do and when there were certain big things they went and this is what we're doing and oh. so they gave us a, a quick rundown of rise of skywalker they quit run down a mantle i mean not math not loads of stuff but you know and, not, and you know, baby yoda was a thing we you know we we knew about um but, but yeah, it was just again because we had that period of time um, when we were planning, you know, pl what what would become High Republic. So they just had to make sure there was no point us going down a. Well, we think it should be about this bounty hunter as a kid that has to get across. You know, it's like we could have spent days doing that, and then they would say, "Yeah, but we flew you to Skywalker Ranch, and you can't use any of that stuff now." So they just said on the day one, "Here you are. This is what's going on. Don't do that. Come up with something new." So, um, but that's, you know, that's quite a rare, rare thing. That's but also, cool. usually you have such a brief, you know, a brief on a project and they say, you know, we want you to write a book about this character or we want you to write a comic about that character. So it's not usually a problem. 
the difficulty is when you're doing something like Tony Solo and you're writing a story about young Han Solo, there are so many blocks you go, well, it obviously it'll be nice if there were Wookiee slaves. Yeah. And then, you know, and, and then when, when they tell you you can't do that because it's in the film, you go, well, yeah, I, I should have probably twigged that would happen, you know, so, um, so yeah. Right on. Now, uh, another project you worked on were your Vader's Castle IDW comics, mm. right? And yes. obviously we talked about your horror influence and, and, and being a fan of that. And I mean, obviously, Tarkin and Dooku fit right in there, being that their actors are old universal horror actors, right? So I mean, yeah. what, was your, what was your deal on that? Was that your idea? Did you pitch that concept? It was a joint pitch between me and Mike Sklane. So we, Mike is also a massive Universal and Hammer fan. Um, so whenever we get together, we end up talking a little bit about Star Wars and a lot about classic horror. Um, and we were talking at San Diego Comic Con a few years back, and we were talking about how both of us would really want to do a story where um, you have Peter Cushing as Frank, uh, uh, Tarkin as Frankenstein and Dooku as Dracula, um, you know, uh, and, and do that kind of thing, or do a Frankenstein story, a, a Dracula story with Tarkin as the Van Helsing character, you know. So we would like, you know, because of the obvious links. Um, and around that time, Mike was wanting to do a, um, some kind of Halloween special in comics. And so through the conversations, it just became a case of, oh, you could do this, or you could do a ghost story, or you could do a mummy story, or you could do. Um, and so we pulled together a pitch uh, and, put, and pitched it to IDW and to Story Group um, together. So, uh, you know, it's not completely my idea. It's not completely Mike's. It's a bit of both, really, you know. And obviously it helps when Mike Sublane is one of the people coming up with the ideas because he's option trader. But, um, you know, he still has to go through the same pitching process as everyone else. So, um, so yeah, so when he got the green light, he sort of like said, you've got all those ideas we came up with, run with it, put it together in something. And hardly any of them made it into the actual final thing because of various different reasons. And, yeah. and we got what we, we now have with the Vegas Castle series. But yeah, it definitely came from, it came from Peter Cushion and, and Christopher Lee. Yeah, you, you can even see it in the art. I mean, just the, the first time when in the Dooku pages, right? It, it just, it's, oh, it's phenomenal. That, that yeah, art Kelly there. Jones basically just played Curse of Dracula a lot right. and, then, and then drew. I mean, he's not drawing Dooku. He's yeah. drawing Dracula in those pages. That's it, exactly. That's exactly what you see. It, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. It's beautiful. So uh, I don't want to go too deep into I'm going to save you some, some time here, but I want to get kind of a little deeper into Dooku then. Let's jump into that. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. the audio play, you kind of jumped into how that worked. And it's the first mm. Star Wars audio play, right? I'm, I'm very used to going through the 50 or 60 books I go through all the time. Okay. Because in, in my world, my, my anxiety, my medication is, a, is an audio book. If I need something, I'd rather have somebody else's. I want Mark Thompson's voice in my head rather than mine. Don't we all? Okay. Yes. Yeah, don't we all, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's what I do. And this audio book and this audio play is so much different. It flows so different because it's not a novel adapted, right? It kind of reversed it because the novel is adapted from the radio play. But yeah. um, this world, how do I say, how did you get Dooku? Did they say, can you write a Dooku book? Or were you like, can I write a Dooku book? Where were we? First I didn't ask there? to write Dooku for, you know, um, I, I, Dooku wasn't one of my go-to characters in Star Wars at all. I mean, I, I have a complicated history with the prequels. Um, and I... <laughs> Scott, sorry. I lo- Scott's the same damn way. Scott did yeah, not yeah. like Dooku, and he has a complicated relationship with the prequels. So I didn't mean to cut yeah. you off, but I could see Scott's face no, no. there like, oh, man, Dooku, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But sorry. until... And then, and then Clone Wars happened. And yes. Dooku in the Clone Wars, I think, is superb. And, and you know, and I love... Obviously, I, I love Christopher Lee, and... So I love his performance as Dooku. The character itself didn't really thrill me. Um, I had been talking to him about, I want to do audio in Star Wars for a while. And I've been sending them some of the stuff I've done on other, you know, other franchises. Um, and so they, uh, Del Rey wants to do it as well. And so the, the opportunity came up and because I'd been barraging them and I had a history of writing audio drama. So they knew, they knew that I'd be able to, just get on with it because we didn't have much time to do it either you know from the actual point of commissioning through to it coming out there you know it wasn't that long i think it was the, the autumn before it, it came out that we commissioned it um so they needed someone with a history in audio drama um and they needed it to be a bit of a halfway house between true audio drama and and an audiobook as well so that's why there is quite a lot of narration in, in dooku as well um because a large proportion of the audience 
would probably have never listened to a traditional forecast audio drama because over here is massive. We still have a national radio station that plays, uh, has a radio play every afternoon and a radio soap opera. Oh, wow. And, oh. um, radio 4, BBC Radio 4. And so it's, it's still a major part over here. And I've got so many old time radio American shows on tape with like, you know, from Shadow, Superman, you know, um, Sherlock Holmes. Um, but I, I know that in the States, it sort of fell away, really, um, with, with television um, and radio drama sort of fell away. Again, in Star Wars, we had the radio dramas of the adaptations of the films. And there were some things, I think, Dark Empire as a, as a radio drama, or audio drama of it. Some of the Legends books were adapted and the comics were adapted. But there had not been anything for a while. So they came to me and said, you know, we, we are interested in doing it. Would you be willing to do it? Can you fit it in? It was just when I was, I was leaving um, Skywalker after our first week working on what would become the High Republic, and they they dropped this bombshell as I was leaving, thinking I've got lots of work to do now. And they went, "Yes, you have. By the way, can you also do this work as well?" Um, and it, again, it was that kind of thing that I think if in any any other project, I would have said, "I'd love to, but I have got to do all this other stuff you've just given me to do." But because it was audio drama, I wanted to do it because I, I, it was a case of proving that audio drama could work in Star Wars. It was a bit of a personal project for me. And then they said, and it's Dooku. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> um, and again, I could see there would be a story to be told. But even I don't think I read much in Legends of the Dooku stuff. I, I, I didn't read um, it's the Yoda book, I can't remember, Dark and the title's gone. It's one of the ones I haven't read because I, you know, it didn't really, Dooku didn't really interest me. Um, and so I then had to take a step back and go, well, yeah, can I make something out of this character? Um, and I did it by getting home. So I flew back over to the UK. I hadn't, I sort of, I'd sort of said yes again, much to the, just, um, to, to stay in my agent, but I'd sort of said very strongly, this will probably happen, but can you at least let me get home and, recover a bit and then I'll, I'll think about it and um i watched some clone wars when i got back uh, and i watched the episodes when um the emperor or um darth sidious tells um dooku to kill um Asajj. and i went yeah there's absolutely a story you can tell here um and and it came with certain they wanted it to be his life story they they, they were very and they wanted it to be up to him leaving the order and not actually about so much him becoming a Sith, but more to explore the reasons he became a Sith. Mm -hmm. But actually, I mean, there's part of me thinking, you know, that story is still going to be told somewhere else. So, you know, it's sort of like setting the groundwork for that. But I know. And I, I think that thing was, I was lovely the way it went where he didn't go straight Sith at that point. It was his own decision yeah. where he wasn't pulled away by Sidious at that moment. You know, that I think that was better that way, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it gave me, I mean, I think part of the interesting thing was when I suddenly realised they were talking about a, I mean, what's he, he's 80 or something when we see him um, in episode two. Um, and they wanted me to start when he was 10. So I was like, that's a long time to do, in a, you know, and it's it six, what, six and a half hours long. So that is a long time in audio, you know, audio drama, but also that's a long life to get into it. And the more I was thinking about it, the more I was thinking he, were, he must have been a good Jedi because he's a well-respected Jedi. You know, he's, he's, he's Yoda's Padawan. That's massive. You know, it's, um, they're shocked when they realize what he's doing. You know, Qui-Gon loves him. Mm -hmm. There's, he, so he must have been good at what he was doing, but it can't have come out of nowhere either. You know, the dark side doesn't work like that. The dark side doesn't, it's not like getting bitten by a zombie. You don't suddenly go, oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, yellow eyes. Yeah. Um, it, it, it has to build from somewhere. So it became a challenge. And it's been so gratifying to have people say to me that they went into not really caring much about Dooku and have come out caring more about him because that's exactly how I feel. I yeah. feel quite protective over him now um, because I had to find the story and I had to, I had to learn who he was um, to write it. And, and that was the fun part, I think. Yeah, well, you helped us. You helped us find agree. out who yeah. Dooku was. 
Right, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, it was, I had just reread uh, the Django Fett comic series, Open Season, which was kind mm. of like, this is how Dooku fell from grace and left the mm. Jedi Order. And I'm like, this story does nothing for me. And then, you know, I re-listened to your novel uh, or your, your audio drama, mm. and I'm like, this works so much better. This is such a great story. So yeah, I mean, you brought in Cypher Diaz and... Yeah, uh, which uh, actually came straight out of a old Legends comic, um, the inspiration for that. So I, I now, again, it's late at night and my brain's starting to wilt. But um, So I can't remember the name of the comic, but there was a comic, is it Envisioned? I can't remember. But there's a comic where, in one of the old Dark Horses, where Dooku gets Cypher Diaz's body sent to him. On surrender, um, and and there's a moment where he's standing. The coffin's glass topped, and he's got his hand resting on it, and he calls him old friend. And I remember reading that when it first came out. So long before I was working on Star Wars, long before there was you know canon and legends and all that business, um, and loving the idea that they were friends because it that is again your classic, you know. It's like, again, I'm an, I'm an old Doctor Who fan. The Doctor and the Master, they were friends at college and now they're enemies. I love those stories when you have friends who become enemies. Um, Me too. Obi-Wan and Darth Vader. Yeah. That's the biggie. You know, so I wanted to tell that story of making him, you know, because there was also that thing of, like, does Cypher really exist? Is it, you know, is it a, a cover name? You know, right. all that kind of thing. So I decided to show, I know he absolutely existed and they, they grew up together because it makes it all the more tragic then, mm -hmm. you know, it, and it makes Palpatine all the more evil that he would, you know, eventually get Dooku to do that. Uh, right. his friend's madness you know because you so, have, you have absolutely turned him into a a person that we would have loved to see as a, a good jedi i would love to see good jedi stories from dooku um because mm. he's built into that piece right i'd love to see that kind of thing live action i just the character as a whole as you just see him hate filled in in, in mm. uh the movies and in clone wars nothing but hate and you give us this personal piece where even when he met sifo you 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 would mention that he didn't need people, but in this form, maybe with Sifo Diaz, this companion, maybe he did need, you know, and, and he yeah, knew yeah. that and recognized that. Even though he doesn't need a lot of people around him, he needs somebody important, right? And well, he kind of keeps going I... away with his rail and Qui-Gon and on for it. Well, exactly. And I think that's the major part about Dooku. He desperately needs people around him. Um, and if he had people, you know, and it comes back to that quote in Rise of Skywalker, they, you know, they conquer, I can't remember the exact quote, but, you know, they conquer us by making us feel like we're alone. And Dooku is surrounded by people all the time and he's better when he's with people. Um, the tragedy is that those people keep leaving him and going off and doing other things and he stays where he is and I think that was his, fa his falling uh, his failure um, and yeah they they all, he because he had that personality or the way I wrote him, that he had that personality that he did think himself he, I, I've said before Anakin is, is told he's the chosen one, Dooku just believes he is um, <laughs> and and throughout his life whether it's yoda whether it's cypher whether it's uh, whether it's oh um, not everyone whether it's um, qui-gon they're all there to poke him and go just remember you're a jedi just remember you're like us um and then he finds out that he is actually an ability and that goes a bit to his head but you know so but again it, he gets pulled back down um by his companions to the point where he's safe um, and then it's only later on where he thinks he can go and stand on his own that he realizes he can't. So he goes through his entire life thinking he's stronger than everyone when actually he needs everyone around him. Um, which I think is why, you know, there's that scene without giving too much spoilers when Yoda, this is absolutely a spoiler, Yoda first becomes his, his teacher. He doesn't teach him for a few days because he wants yeah. to see what happens when Dooku's left alone. And then he sees. Um, and then, you know, you have to ask, well, then, did Yoda do it right after that? Because Yoda then has to make some decisions that, of, of how he, he, he teaches Dooku. Um, but yeah, he was a fast, he, he turned out to be a far more fascinating character. I, 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 I'd write him again in an instant. And I'd definitely write, I'd, I'd like to re write Sith Dooku, but I'd love to go back and write some more adventures um, of Dooku as a Jedi. I'd love to hear it. I want to. I want to know what happened to Lean Castana because that, that was another new character, yes. right? We we learned of Rail through this in Master and Apprentice, which I'll ask about in yeah. a second, right? Yeah, yeah. But Lean Castana. I mean, this this relationship with he and her were, was was amazing, and the convors and just it really to me more so than even Rail or Qui Gon or anything else. Lean really brought out 
this this uh, personal side of Dooku. Like he really mm-hmm. cared for her, wanted her to be his master, cared for the con. Was gonna build build a, a whole uh, cage for the convoy when he was just watching it. Yeah, and yeah. He really cared for her and and everything around. It. Can you talk about a little bit about Lean, where that came from, where she came from? Yeah, sure. So originally, because um, in Legends he has a different, he has Thane as his, his master. Um, and so I did toy the, of making it Thane, and you know, so and that Yoda and Thane would be joint masters almost in a way, um, because it is that thing as well. If you're the Padawan to the Grand Master, the Grand Master is going to be busy right. quite a lot, um, and you're going to be you're going to be his Padawan for years, and so you're going to be Yoda's going to have to go off and do things, and so you know, and I, I've never I've always liked the idea of masters in the Jedi Order saying okay not saying that Yoda isn't good at everything, but, you know, when he's busy and saying, right, that person over there is really good at beast control. Spend some time with them because I need to do this and you need to get better at that. So, you know, because the masters trust each other, you know, and, and it's part of the order as a whole. It's their job to train the next generation. So that's how I've always viewed that, that sort of generation of Jedi. Um, so I liked the idea that Yoda almost had like a second in place so when he was being busy he wouldn't be leaving Dooku on his own but perhaps he didn't particularly choose the right one um and Le- lean came out of that original idea because I originally was going to make it thing and that was like well but we you know again we've seen that you know we've seen we know that's his master in in legend so the whole point is that we can do something new so let's do something new um and so it became lean um and again I'm always been fascinated by the Jedi that they've had a thousand years of knowing that the Sith were really bad and that Dark Side is really bad, but it's all right because they've gone. End of story. Um, you know, and I've struggled with that because the Jedi also know history and the Jedi have been around that long that they would know that actually the galaxy is still full of things that could be used. And part of my what I would I would see the Jedi's role would be to go out there and make sure there isn't Sith weapons lying around. Because if again, if you go back into Legends, the Sith had some pretty big weapons, which right. must still be out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't want anyone else getting hold of them. So they would have people who would go and find them. And that would be their job because it just made sense to me. So I wanted to write about one of those Jedi. So that's where she came from. Um, and and again, and it's all part of my personal uh, um, issues with, with some of the prequel stuff. It's like, you know, why were they so surprised it was the Sith? You know, mm. why do they sit there and go, well, there's been a Sith for a thousand years. They're extinct. It's not, the universe isn't that black and white. Um, right. So I wanted to input some Jedi who perhaps would question that. Um, and, and that's where she came from. And again, if we know the kind of Padawan that Dooku created in Qui-Gon, a Padawan who questioned everything. So I wanted to see go back through and again you can see in Luke, Obi-Wan, Yoda, you can see a very string line of training that goes through that. Mm. Qui-Gon's different, we all know that from yeah. you know, looking at the character, so that that difference had to come from Dooku. So again, it wouldn't have come from Yoda either, it's not really Yoda's style. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So there had to be another influence. So that's yeah, that's what all the questions I, I was asking to get to that point. No, you you actually had one line in that whenever they were talking about Sith artifacts that just it cracked me up, and I, I don't know if it was an inside joke or not, but it was uh, Darth Krull, and I thought the lightsaber would be spikier. <laughs> was that a yeah. reference to the Krull movie and the the a, a little bit, yeah? And it was just we thought it was, it was just a funny thing. So we wanted to have that moment, especially when they were young, mm-hmm. when they acted like kids. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't act like Padawans. You know, they, they acted, I, I like writing kids a lot and I, I like having the opportunity to write kids in a adult book. Um, and yeah, I was trying my hardest to make them. When you write in Star Wars, there is a certain turn of phrase and, and characters speak in a certain way that is slightly unnaturalistic at points. Mm-hmm. But you know, with, when you were writing the kids, I, what, I needed them to feel like real kids. I needed them to feel like real friends. And so, and I, so I needed to have that moment kids would look uh, there's a moment actually in it where one of them calls yoda goblin or something um and that got thrown around a lot between us all because you know was it being disrespectful well yes because kids are disrespectful about their teachers Mm -hmm. um 
And it was only then when I, I caught onto the fact that Yoda himself would find it funny that we managed to keep it in. Um, because you don't want to throw shade at Yoda and you don't want to sort of, you know, in, in universe, he's, he's Yoda. You know, there's a certain weight there that you have to bear in mind. But yeah, if he's training kids, he would be a really annoying teacher for kids. If you imagine oh, yeah. what he's like all oh, the imagine. time. Um, so they would take the mickey out of him. They, it would absolutely be what they would do out of respect as well. You know, there, it's, there's a, a warmness there, I think, you know. Um, and same way, you know, I thought it was funny that in the middle of a Sith, archive in the middle of the temple which they found that they shouldn't be able to get it they got through a secret door to get to they see a lightsaber and they go oh, i just thought it would look more sith you know and because they have no idea what sith looks like so they right. just abandoned it spiky um so i just thought yeah it was, it was trying it was trying to get those bits of levity in there and also those bits of what people are really like which i think yeah. always you know it's han, it's han solo tapping a stormtrooper on the shoulder to try and distract him you know it's it's the it's the conversation over the over the com in the New Hope. With again, most of these are involving Han, um, but you know, it's the, that's why we love Han Solo because he talks largely like a real person, yeah. um, and he, you know, and he take he has quips and he has, you know, it's actually Luke. No matter how much I love Luke, is is the straight man, you know, and so it's a, we when we do quotes, we remember Han because yeah. He has, he has the funny lines and he has the lines that we we wish we could be han solo when we're having conversations you know oh yeah um, very very right so true we wish yeah. we, we we want we want to be luke when we want to be all deep and meaningful and, and you know and moody but um again it's it's trying to get that balance between what sounds star wars and sounds real life and it is quite a there are loads of times when i write stuff in manuscripts and they you know note comes about saying no it's too it's too contemporary it's too you know and so you just have to pull it back um and then you know you put it in sometimes to try and push it and see how far you can get um but there is a very fine line no i, th I think you're on the line good because again when you know i usually when everybody asks which books to should they get into in canon this is in my top five every time oh you know you. and it, it's it's Lovely. just to get into a, a flow of, of a it's a good listen um it, it's it's great story for somebody we already know and again the relationships within the story just really are what, are what make it for me and like, especially when I have Rail, Qui-Gon and Dooku in the same scenes, I'm like, yes. wow, this is just really, you know, fantastic. When Qui-Gon was a kid was going down there and going to the poker game and all this stuff, yeah. just their quips back and forth, Rail and, and Qui-Gon. I just think the relationships you guys built, everybody built, because I said you guys, because I know Claudia Gray did Master of Yeah, well, Cla Claudia invented Rail. And um, we were, again, we were working. So she was, she was working on Master Apprentice when we were working, starting to work on what became Project Luminous. And so I knew she was working on that at the time because she was because we were literally there she was like, having conversations with story group because you would because they're literally across the table from me um and so and then we were talking in the evenings about what she was doing with with master and apprentice and then when they asked me to do dooku i asked if i could put rail into it because it just seemed a really good opportunity and also i was already working with claudia so it just seemed it made sense you know so she sent me the passages with with him in it, and I think she was on her, her first, second draft or something at that point. Um, and I came back and said, oh, can we do this? And we sort of changed a few things around and I sent her my passages that when, when I wrote those bits, because I, I started writing it really quickly after we got the green light. Um, so yeah, so she, it was definitely her creation. Um, and I think he's brilliant. And again, I want to see more. Yes. You know, we, we, I could have done six hours of him and Dooku, you know, it's, oh, um, sure. and, and I think he's got, there's a story there to be told about his life before and after a master and apprentice as well. I, I a hundred percent agree. But this is star Wars. Every character has a story. That's right. basically they, they do. And if they don't have one, we'll make one up in our, exactly. history, so somebody <laughs> whether it's within five years, 25 years, 30 years, you know, eventually there will be a story. That's it. If I, if I put patience to somebody else anymore, right? Like I want, I want, I want, I want patience. This has been a five year process. Canon's not that old, you know, it's all yeah. coming. It's all coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you also got to do a, a couple of uh, different areas that we haven't been into as much, right? Like we dealt with, um, like, like you mentioned, the kids in the temple, mm -hmm. initiates, not even Padawans, right? That's something we don't deal yeah. with a lot. Never really talk about seekers, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I really enjoyed that piece, um, seeing that they haven't even become Padawans yet, seeing them younger and going through the temple. I just want you to know that that's stuff that as nerds, as a, as a huge nerd, I, I get into that stuff. You know, if I haven't mm -hmm. been able to explore the temple and know that there are houses or clans, 
things like that yeah. and, and get to go through a, um, their, their test before a, uh, their Padawan test. Mm. I mean, that's mm. huge, man. So I, I guess as a, as a nerd, I had to be a huge cool deal. And that's a huge responsibility too, right? I oh, God, absolutely. And it all came from, you know, the, um, the book, the Jedi code, you know, and, and I, I love that. And, and I've read it so many times. And so it, uh, sorry, sorry, the Jedi path. And so it, I mean, that's all the stuff that was, it was mentioned you sort of didn't there we go we we didn't really have that in the expanded year. i mean it was there and obviously we saw in the new jedi order or you know in luke's jedi order in in the expanded universe we saw how it happened then but we they never really went back further than padawan um in in the stories that i read anyway um but they had it on the on this additional material and you know the path and, and various the the book um the book about the force um the central book of the force and all those, those kind of things and so I just wanted it. It gave me a chance to explore it. And they had to rein me in. You know, they really had to rein me in because I was, I could have just spent that entire, I could have really nerded out and just done the entire play before he became a Padawan. Um, and I know they also, there's a moment, you know, they go, are you trying to write Star Wars or Harry Potter or both? I was like, well, pretty much both, you know, because again, <laughs> it, it's fascinating. You know, Jedi take these kids at babies mm -hmm. and they, yeah. that's all they know. Um, and it's interesting because obviously, again, I've got to be very careful with High Republic. We have a Trandoshan Jedi, um, mm -hmm. Skier. And people keep saying to me, what's it like for Skier being a Trandoshan Jedi? I was like, no, he's a Jedi who happens to be a Trandoshan because he would have been in the temple since he was a kid. So yeah. he's not really spent much time around Trandoshans. He spent mm -hmm. his time around Jedi. Uh -huh. and, and while the High Republic Jedi are slightly different, that's still part of it, you know. So all of those Jedi, they've only ever known Jedi. So yeah. I think it's interesting to explore that. Yeah, we've never seen like a, a Wookiee and a Trandoshan get along. And I guess we're gonna have to see that relationship at some point in High Republic. Yeah. So that's because they've got neat. no reason not to. Yeah. You know, because a Jedi would also know that it's not Skier's fault that his race right. does that. Um, huh. And there's an interview that's gone up today on um, starwars.com with me and Daniel, who I know has been on with you as well. And, you know, and I say in that, I have a real problem with monocultures in any kind of fiction and, and you know, and, and with Star Wars, you know, that not all trans-oceans will be evil because not all humans are evil. You know, it's the, that's the way it works. Um, and so it's something that I'm really keen to always explore, you know, and have, um, have those moments. But yeah, so it, it is interesting what you do with a Jedi because they're not species linked at all. They are completely their order that's all they know um and it's a scary old thing to think what they do you know but um um it's fascinating as well oh, it, it's fascinating to us um sorry i lost my place there real quick no no um oh there was a lot of uh, okay how long has was project luminous going i had to have been going on for a few years i'm, I'm just linking the yeah, yeah. I promise so no like, no it's um it's been going on two and a half years i think um from the moment we were asked so we were asked and then we didn't really know who the other people were um until right before we had our first sort of retreat to start discussing it so because and i yeah, say it because been, there's been a lot of mentions right you you threw a lot of easter eggs in dooku and, and so the nerds that are us again we're trying to pick them out already a little bit okay just because yeah, we, yeah. we we see those um those were obviously intentional and I'm not going to ask a bunch of stuff. I mean, has that been a plan that you guys just kind of throw them in there? We, are you, again, I ask this, are you asked to throw pieces in as, as breadcrumbs or was that all you guys? No, the five we just do it because it's fun. <laughs> we just do it. I mean, there are points. Whenever you write any Star Wars, and part of the joys of working with Story Group is that, again, they know everything. They know when we, as I said earlier on, we have those parts we don't know. Story group know exactly who what red cup is and what all these other code words are. So they'll they'll do moments when they say instead of doing that planet, if it's not major to the plot, you know, instead of mentioning Moncal, Moncal, why don't you mention this water world? And you go, okay, why? No reason. And then it will turn <laughs> up in something. Um, and they're really good at doing that. They're really good at dropping those little no, those little mentions in. Um, but we sort of the yeah we we definitely started throwing stuff in ourselves. I mean, there's stuff in Master and Apprentice too. When, I, when we were writing those books, we hadn't worked out what, the, what Project Luminous was. There was five, five storylines. So actually in Dooku, there are references to all five versions of Project Luminous. Right. Um, ah. Because I didn't know at which that point 
which, that it was going to become the High Republic. So, because um, I'm sitting here going, uh, Radaki, Darth Crawl, Trennis. I'm I'm trying to work them all out. I'm like, okay, wait, we're going, you know, in a, in the Lost Twenty, all this stuff. I'm like, okay, there's Lost from the High Republic. We're going to meet some of these people. We're going to learn their stories. I'm so excited about it. So again, I won't have you spoil anything because I yeah. want to read it myself. But yeah, pretty excited. And I'm. Uh, what makes me happy is I know that after we go through High Republic, it'll make me revisit everything else, and I'll be going. But that's Thank part of the joy of it, isn't it? You know, and that's again. I think, again, that's the point of what I love about modern Star Wars is the fact you can do that. And there's stuff that's sort of, you know, leading into, you know, there's probably stuff that we'll, we'll go back and we'll see things in some of these other series, like the Ahsoka series or whatever. And then we'll go back and see something in Mandalorian and go, oh, right. That's why that was there or whatever. And yeah, and so we've all been doing it. Um, so Charles has done it quite a lot in the Marvel um, mainline with, um, you know, the Starlight mission and things. And, and, I put the, there's a couple of mentions of things in Vader's castle, some of which have been picked up, some of which haven't. Um, and so it's just fun. It's just that, you know, I think I love Easter eggs and anyone who's read my stuff knows I like Easter eggs and I like having references to old stuff. Um, there was a note on one of my things recently from Story Group. Are you trying to canonize everything in the Ewok movies? I was like, yes, I obviously am. <laughs> um, and as long as it doesn't trip people up, as long as you don't, someone who's new coming to these things and will read it and then not know, you know, one of the jokes has been that I will put Jackson in anything I can. Um, <laughs> and, and, and let's face it, I will. But there's a lappy mentioned in Dooku and I hope, you know, people who know it will go, oh, that's him doing his Jackson gig. Um, and then people who don't know what that is will just, it's just another, another name in Star Wars, which already has so many re names, you know. Right. Um, and I think Star Wars especially works for that. I mean, let's face it, we watched New Hope. We didn't know what the Clone Wars were. We didn't, well, we didn't know what a Jedi was, to be perfectly you know, frank. Um, and all these things were just thrown in. Jabba, it was all just thrown in so you could pick it up later. So that's what I love about writing this universe. That you can absolutely just throw in a nod and a wink. And as long as you do it right, and as long as it's not a moment when everyone sits down and goes, well, do you remember when we went to that planet? Um, it shouldn't derail the story. And yeah. then people who've been sticking around, Cy Spurrier, who worked on Dr. Afra for a while, he always says that an Easter egg is there as a reward, not as a punishment, if you don't understand it. And so that's the way I always try and look at it as well. Very it's cool. there just, if you've stuck with something, um, it's a way of going, oh, yeah, well done. Here's something. Here's a bit of a wink between us. <laughs> and on the other side, as a new fan, hopefully you'll, you'll recognise some of the names when you come up against them in other stuff as well. So it's, it's, it's supposed to be a win-win. It doesn't always feel like that, but it's supposed to be a win-win. It, it feels like it to us. So that's yeah. cool. So now I tell you what, Ken, we're up on an hour right now, and I can go for three more hours on Duke. <laughs> let me ask you about Jackson right there. Since yes. you brought, so you've done two uh, certain point of views, right? Uh, yeah. It was uh, Time of Death, right? um the well okay ice cream saber pain right <clears throat> when, <and laughs> that was in the audio book <laughs> ice cream <laughs> ice, right. it sounds like ice anyway, cream <laughs> but yeah fantastic story there yeah. and then this one you get, you get you get called back in you get jackson and lobot okay Lo, i happen to love lobot i call my son lobot yeah. um and then uh but and jackson what, what's your obviously you love jackson where'd that come from did you had you to make star first, wars he was in my too? first experience my first experience of star wars was jackson Really? So I had not seen the film, and I picked up Marvel Comics UK's Star Wars Weekly, which reprinted the old Marvel run. And the first issue I re ever read was Han recruiting Jackson. Um, and so I knew Jackson before I knew Luke Skywalker. I sort of knew who Luke Skywalker was from toys and pictures, but I'd never actually experienced him. So this was between New Hope and Empire. Um, I was very disappointed when I watched Empire and... Jackson wasn't in it. I was like, come on. There's all those bounty hunters. You could have put a rabbit in. Um, and <laughs> and yeah, and so that's why I love Jackson because I had no idea as a kid that you weren't supposed to like Jackson, you know, because, uh, you know, there's another part of me going, it's a big hairy guy in a gorilla suit over there as a kid, you know, obviously I would never say that about Chewie now without fear of losing my arms. What's so different about a bunny? And then, of course, you get to Return of the Jedi, and there's a, literally a fish in charge of the ship. Um, and so <laughs> it was only years later that I realized that people didn't, you know, weren't fond of the guy, and, and that George Lucas 
really wasn't fond of him. Um, and so, but by then it was too late. I, I loved him um, because I'd read those comics over and over again because I had no other Star Wars. So, you know, I'd book the odd book and the Marvel comics, which I just read and read and read and read. Um, so, yeah, so that's why I love Jackson. And then when they gave me to write the chance to write Jackson, I was like, you sure? <laughs> and then I did. <laughs> um, and I threw everything I could in that story. And then they, it, it was, people loved it. And, that, and the kids loved it. And that was my biggest, you know, I loved that moment when it was getting loads of letters in to the comic from kids saying, we love that character. Like, well, do more. So they asked me to do more. And it was like, really, again? Um, and yeah, and they said, who do you want to team up with? Well, Lando, think that they're never going to let me do that. Okay, then. What? Okay. <laughs> right. um, and yeah, and Jackson has got a bit of a life of his own now. And yeah, I do sneak him into things um, when he probably shouldn't be there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all come because we were, it was only ever going to be eight pages. We were going to do an eight page. It was a bit of a tip of a hat going, there's the Jackson story. And now it's become an annual event. Um, awesome. and, and then this year we've had three Jackson appearances, four, three or four Jackson appearances, um, which is just bonkers. I do, I do worry that you know you could o overdo him, but um, <laughs> see, I can only um, imagine again, 10 year old me being 43 year old me now going, Wow, you're gonna create Star Wars, right? That, that's you, though. I mean, it's like, Wow, you're gonna create this stuff, I'm gonna take this character and make him more mainstream than ever. I mean, that's that's awesome because you can tell really that you're a fan i keep saying the word nerd because we, we embrace that right oh yeah, but you no, can I'm all for being a nerd. tell that you're you're quoting off legend stuff now was that because of your reading prior to this project it seems yeah, like right. but i do see you do the a lot of research too more um more in the comics and the books to be fair i mean i read so i remember I'm, I'm, i remember going in like all of us at that age going in and, and seeing area the jedi uh, uh, area of the empire and going what now what there's a book now mm -hmm. um because my copy of Splinter of Mind's Eye was falling to bits, you know, because I'd read that so many times. And yeah, but when I was when I was a kid, I loved the Marvel comics. And then as a teen and 20s, Dark Horse, I was all over. So, so I think I saw Dark Empire in the comic store first before I saw that there was going to be the, the Tim Zorn books. Um, and I just freaked out when Dark Empire 1 came in, especially as it was British, a British artist on it who I knew from 2000 AD. I couldn't quite believe there was Luke and the Emperor and Leia all in a comic again. That was just bonkers. Um, and then all the way through, yeah, um, Dark Horse, I read pretty much everything. My favorite of all time um, comic is Republic um, from around the time of the, again, I wasn't a big fan of the prequels. I thought Republic was an amazing comic um, and I still do. And a lot of the Ventress stuff from Dooku is I went straight back and read Republic again. Oh man, I didn't even go to boring. Ventress. See, I could have went six hours, Kevin. You're killing me. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and so yeah so and I, and I read you know I dipped in and out of the books just because I didn't you know there's a the, you know what it's like to be a Star Wars fan and also a fan yeah. of other stuff as well there's only so many hours of the day when you got yeah. a job and whatever um and so I start with the comics throughout and I dipped in and out of the books and then since I've been picking up and you know the ones I'm, I've not I will put my hands up and said I should have read Darth Bane trilogy far earlier than I did, but you know, I'm, I'm glad I have now. Got me through reading this year when I couldn't read at the beginning of the pandemic. I could not right. read a thing. Um, and I suddenly realized I've not read the third one of the Darth Paint trilogy. Picked it up, sat there a weekend, read it, and haven't stopped reading books since this year. So um, yeah, the, the Legends stuff is still massively important to me. Yeah. Cameron stuff's massively important to me because of what I work in. Um, modern Star Wars is important for me because my kids love it. Um, and they discovered it themselves through Rebels after years of me trying to get them to watch it. Um, so, yeah, Rebels and, and Force Awakens and everything is massive for me because I suddenly got two daughters who were Star Wars fans, you know, and so the house became a proper Star Wars house nice. other than being, here's the room with all dad stuff in, you know, and, and my wife Claire's <laughs> a big Star Wars fan as well, but it was still very much like, here's the stuff that our parents like this is what we like. And then they discovered Rebels and it was like, this is what we like. And my daughter now, her room is a shrine to Chewbacca. I think she'd rather have Chewbacca as a dad. I keep saying, <laughs> he'll be away for years. He'll be away for years, he won't come back. Um, but you know, she loves him. Um, and so, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a part of my life for all the way through since picking up that comic with Jackson in. Um, and now has taken over our lives in a way that I could never have imagined, but I absolutely adore than it has. That's awesome. so cool. Awesome. I feel, yeah. I feel the passion and I, I love it and appreciate it. 
Yep. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to take you into, we're going to, I'm going to cut all that talk and questions for you, those, those kind of things. And yeah. just do a little bit of line talk with you and we're going to let you okay. off the hook cabin. All right. Um, okay. So rapid fire, not really rapid fire. I speak fast, but okay. all time okay. favorite star Wars film. Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi. Nice. You go, why? I used to say empire um, mm -hmm. because actually, you know, it's, it's obviously fantastic. But then when I, you, I was thinking more and more, every time I think about star Wars, I think of return of the Jedi. I think of Jabba's palace. I think of the emperor turning around and saying, this is a fully, you know, operational battle station. Um, so actually I saw empire was my first one. This is not rapid fire, is it? Um, empire was my first <laughs> one. Um, but then by the time return of the Jedi came along, I was in wholeheartedly. So it, return of Jedi made me the lifelong fan that the comics and, and empire started. Excellent. No, I prefer it that way, Kevin, just so you know. We're good. Okay. How about non-Star Wars? I mean, I think I kind of get it, but... Um, Ghostbusters. Is my, is my, Ghostbusters is my comfort film. So awesome. If I don't want to pull a um, Star Wars film or, or whatever from, I, I will stick Ghostbusters on. Awesome. Marco is going to be so disappointed he wasn't here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's I his know. favorite. <laughs> well, see, and then I'm sitting here lucky. I I love my Ghostbusters all the time. I did, right. I did see. I, I clocked them as soon as. Uh, and oh, to be fair, I've been just trying to look around. You know, at the Green Lantern at the bottom of there as well. I've been looking at everything behind you. So. Well-rounded yeah. geeks to a point. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm surrounded by it too. Green Lantern over yeah. here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Nerds forever. Oh, um, yeah. how about favorite? Okay, I think I know the answer. Maybe I'm wrong. Favorite Star Wars character. <laughs> well, because everyone expects me to say Jackson, right. and, and he's, he's right up there, but it's Obi-Wan. Um, it's always Obi-Wan. Always yeah. Obi-Wan. Actually, cool. Obi-Wan was my other entry point in Star Wars because my gran bought me the Obi-Wan Kenner figure before I really knew what oh. Star Wars was. So I was like, thanks, you've bought me an old man. you bought me a doll of an old man. <laughs> Cheers, gran. Because over here, the only thing we had was Action Man, which was these big sort of like, you know, oh, yeah. figures like that of like, um, you know, sort of like a, a huge G.I. Joe. Um, and so for me, that was the only other thing we had like it. And then she bought me this little ditty thing of a bloke with a bit of white beard. I was like, that's interesting. It's not even Father Christmas, is it? Um, so <laughs> yeah, that was, it was around the same time that I, I, got, um, I got that first issue of, of the Marvel. So yeah, the open one's always been there. Awesome. Um, this is a prequel question, but we ask everybody, because Scott and I argue over this all the mm -hmm. time. We're actually going to yep. do an episode about it. Um, Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones? Um, okay, um, Phantom Menace, I guess. Damn it. <laughs> Daniel's the only one that said Attack of the Clones out of every guest we've ever had. Yep. Don't really? I love yeah. Attack of the Clones. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I love the idea I of Attack of the Clones. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think... Um, I'm always actually in my head. I go, Phantom Menace isn't great, and then I watch it and have a good time. Yeah, um, and my kids love it and they adore it. And I think, I think only because it was that thing. I was a someone who took Star Wars far too seriously, and it was a new Star Wars film. And I went and sat in there, and I was expecting everything as I was expecting it to be. And then it was the Phantom Menace, and I went, well, "What's that then?" Um, and it's so it's taken me years to come round, and I, I trust. Attack of the Clones, well, both, all three of them, how they look are amazing. I love the feel of them. Mm -hmm. I love you know, everything about uh, about the Republic at the time and everything. Um, but yeah, I would always go Phantom Menace. I think the Republic at the time. Actually, that's a question I skipped. What did you see that, without getting spoilery, right? Mm -hmm. There's obviously the, the two councils you're going to have to deal with now. You've dealt with the council we all know, right, mm -hmm. Pre in the prequel era but there's going to be obviously a council 200 years before. And obviously mm -hmm. Rancisis and some of these ancient type of people are going to still be around. What, what do you think the, how do I, I we're just not getting a spoiler, the difference between the two councils, their theology, right? We, I think the, the newer one is kind of lost and we kind of see that in Jedi Lost. And what do you see the difference between the two that you can share with us? If you can. Uh, I mean, I think what I can share is I have to be careful because uh, right. also I've been doing a lot of, press this week um, but so i i've got to try and remember at what point those things are coming out um but at the time of the high republic the jedi and the republic are more equals than one being subservient to the other and by the time you get to the prequels the jedi are definitely subservient mm -hmm. excellent um and so yeah so that's 
yeah, so when I say about the Republic, I just love, I love the look. I love the ships of the prequels. I mean, the Jedi Jedi fighters are some of the most beautiful ships. Oh yeah, um, and again, Clone Wars. Clone Wars is just for me the saving grace of that era. Yes. You know, it makes it. And I'm excited that we're having the Obi Wan series, and I'm excited that Hayden's coming back, um, and I'm probably excited because of Clone Wars. You know, so it's it's deepened my appreciation um, of that era. Awesome. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, any where, where we can find you? Any uh, projects you're working on? Anything else you want to share with the with our listeners or watchers? Viewers? Yeah, I mean, uh, the minute as you as you mentioned, if you go onto my Twitter, it does seem to be 110 percent High Republic, but that's just because so much is happening; it's ridiculous. And so every day we've got releases and stuff. Um, but you can find me on Twitter at Kevin Scott. You can come and find my website kevinscott.com um which has a lot of star wars content on it the other thing i'm doing at the minute mainly uh, i've got two books i'm working on at the minute um shadow service which is my own um creator own comic from vault which is about a secret organization called mi666 which is super supernatural spies um and it's definitely not for kids i love that. um <laughs> and then the other thing i'm working on is transformers back to the future um crossover from idw and so that's i think next week we did um, see Gigawatt, right? Is that the... Uh... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot of toy guys in our yeah. groups too. So we he, see things just pop good. out in it. Yeah. He's proudly in my collection. Yes. Good news. Good news. <laughs> yes. um, so those are the other things I'm working on. But yeah, I do apologize for anyone who's following me on social media. All it is is the High Republic at the minute. But, you know, I mean, to be fair, it's either Star Wars, Lego or horror usually. So um, I'm getting the best of all those worlds. You really are. That's, that's it. It's awesome. I'll tell you what, as a, as a fan... I love to see fans making the content that we can consume, cool. enjoy, and then get a chance to talk to you about it. Cause this is, this is a big thing for us. So we appreciate it. Well, no, um, I appreciate you. You invite me in. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a Star Wars fan. It's really hard because you on Twitter and I can't get into conversations anymore about things um, yeah. because it becomes Lucasfilm says this and go, no, 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 no. And I've, I've made mistakes and I've done that before. And I still do it now every now and then I tweet something and go, Oh, that was bad. <laughs> that's gonna end up on a website um because in the day i'm a fan and you know and so it's what you do you talk to your mates and you you talk about the stuff you love and um so it's always good to chat about it because it's what we all do isn't it? excellent all right well then with that we're gonna go ahead and uh take us out of here scott yeah uh <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of blown away right now. This is a great interview. Uh, you can find uh, me, uh, The Art of Scott Solo, on Instagram and Facebook. You can also find uh, the Sarlacc Digest. Check out Sarlacc Digest Central on Facebook for all of our... Just hang out with us. Talk Star Wars. It's what fun. we do. It's what we do. Right on. All right, so until next time with the rest of the crew, take care, guys. Keep it nerdy, everybody.